Hello, I'm Vabren Watts, Health Affairs Director of Health Equity. The October 22 issue focuses on disability and health. According to the CDC, one in four U.S. adults are disabled. People living with disabilities have historically been denied the fundamental access to elements of life, including housing, education, as well as health care. The issue notes that while federal civil rights laws have prohibited discrimination against people living with disabilities, many barriers still exist, resulting in disparities and inequities. Despite this reality, the past 50 years have brought about many changes to our legal landscape. These changes have happened due to many people, including the woman that we will hear from today, Judith Hewitt. The daughter of Holocaust survivors, Judy contracted polio as a child, requiring her to use a wheelchair. Her parents were told to institutionalize her, but they resisted and got her admitted into elementary school. They instilled in their daughter a seed of activism, which sparked her remarkable career as a disability rights leader. Recently, October Issues theme advisors, Lisa Iazzoni and Javier Robles spoke with Judy about her remarkable career and the work that lies ahead to achieve health equity for people living with disabilities. Here's some of that conversation. As you stated in your book, Being Human, uh, when you were a young girl, you had um, a child ask you, are you sick? Which was, I guess, a, a question that shocked you to some extent. Um, can you tell us what the difference is between um, being sick and being a person with a disability? So that's the adult question. And then there was the children, child's reaction. So for me, when I was eight and this young boy came up to me and said, are you sick? It was a recognition that I wasn't invisible. And um, it's not that I ever thought I was invisible, but I was the only person that I knew at that point in my life um, who was a wheelchair user. I had met some people when I was four when I went to uh, the Rest Rehab Center. But outside of that, you know, we didn't see people like myself in children's books or on TV or in cartoons or comics or any place. Do you think that since the time you were asked that question to today, that children view disabilities differently than they did maybe in the past, that there's maybe some growth at least in that area? I mean, I would say There is some more awareness, but not anywhere near what I think all three of us would believe should have happened by today. I think younger children or kids 8, 10, 12 are also beginning to ask the question of why don't we know this when they're reading books like Rolling Warrior, which my book, which was um, geared towards, you know, young adults, they like college students, high school students, are really asking the question of why don't we know this? Why is it not being included in what we're learning in school? So that's very important. Yes, there is more awareness, but not yet anywhere near as much as there should be. Throughout the, from the early 1970s to late 1970s, you were really active in kind of promulgating legislation and regulations to increase access for people with disabilities, specifically Section 504 of the 1973 Rehabilitation Act. Can you tell us a little bit about what life was like for people with disability before these federal laws went into effect, culminating with the 1990 Americans with Disabilities Act? Yes, and I thank you for the question. So I think it, I'm gonna talk a little bit both about the 70s and until the ADA because what is important for people to realize is the laws that we saw coming into B um, started in 1978. No, sorry. The law started in 1968 uh, when Hugh Gallagher was able to get an amendment on a piece of legislation that required that any federal money being used for curbs, for street, cons you know, sidewalk construction, have curb cuts. 
And that, I believe, is kind of the first piece of legislation which really at the federal level was addressing the issue of access. In the 70s, um, what we really started seeing in the 60s was the emergence of disabled student services offices. And I think they were quite important. There weren't huge numbers of them at that time, but University of Illinois, University of Chicago, uh, UC Berkeley, Long Island University, NYU, Brooklyn College, I'm sure it's them up in Massachusetts also, were beginning to form these groups. And the groups were really being formulated, one, because the schools were lacking accessibility, helping students to register for classes, helping blind students get the books they needed, you know, helping with those kinds of accommodations. Um, and what we were learning as we found out about each other is talking much more about not only what was going on on the college campus, but issues that we had of concern relating to what would go on after you left the college campus, on employment, on personal assistance services, whatever it might be. Likewise, uh, in the 70s, what we started to see also was the development of the movement of people with mental health disabilities. That was really very important because the voices of people with psychosocial disabilities were beginning to come forward. And likewise, um, the self-advocacy movement of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities was slowly beginning to emerge. I mean, the reality is in the 1970s, as the disability rights movement was emerging, the college students and others, none of us had really been involved in lobbying. Most of us had never been involved in development of legislation, in meeting with legislators or doing anything like that. So you really saw a lot of things that were going on that were allowing people to begin to um, understand the potential power that we had and the need for us to be able to articulate not only what the problems were, but what the solutions were. You also see people that were learning from other movements. So the civil rights movement, I think, was quite influential for many people for many different reasons. The women's movement, the anti-war movement, all these things were influential. So between the late 1960s and 1980, you've got this development of the independent living movement, uh, centers for independent living starting in Massachusetts, 11 of them coming up in California, Michigan. So people really coming together and talking. Um, so we were really learning and networking and reaching out to legal aid and many other places. And I think one of the biggest issues that many people know about, not as many as I would like, is you know what happened when the 504 regulations were not signed. I think that really was a major uh, point in the disability rights movement, not just in the 70s, but still through today, because it was a relatively small group of people representing a large group of people. And it wasn't just disabled people, it was also coalition development. When President Carter was elected and he committed to having these rules for Section 504 signed because President Nixon and Ford refused to do so. And when his administration was dragging their feet, that's when ACCD really very quickly uh, like a couple of months after the election, came in and started organizing around the country. Because I think we really saw a, a moment in time that we needed to get these regulations signed because of the process that had been going on for over five years. But equally importantly, I think we were really recognizing that it was important for us to be able to affirmatively show that we had um, the ability to really make something meaningfully happen. And then, of course, it really was the, the birth of the ADA because we knew that 504 didn't cover anything in the private sector. So when shopping malls were being constructed, when movie theaters were being constructed, restaurants, uh, people could still be discriminated against if they didn't 
live in a state where there was a law that said you couldn't throw somebody out because they were disgusting and displeasing to look at. So it's, it's been a momentum and the work that had to go on with the Americans with Disabilities Act was in part predicated on the success of what had happened with 504. But I think one of the important parts of the Americans with Disabilities Act is very much that we were able to really on a state by state level get House members and senators to recognize that discrimination wasn't something that occurred once in a while. And it didn't only occur in certain places. So it really is, I think, a, a merging of so many things that it's important to really put it in the full context. So how do you think that historically um, attitudes about people with disabilities have changed, specifically in the healthcare system? So, you know, I have my master's in public health from Berkeley, so I look at public health and healthcare um, as part of a whole, but when I talk about society and the changes that have gone on in society, I think um, implementation of laws like 504 and the Americans with Disabilities Act have been breaking down many different barriers. I would say in the physical environment, we probably have seen the most changes. But I think when you look at like unemployment rates of disabled people, we still see such a disproportionate number of disabled people in the world of work. And I think that really cuts to, um, again, positive things that are going on. Groups like Disability In and National Organization on Disability, Job Accommodations Network, and many others that are focusing on uh, bringing people together to learn about what they're doing, what they can do more. EEOC and the Justice Department and others doing a better job of enforcement. I think one of the positive um, aspects of what's going on when looking at healthcare specifically is when we look at COVID, uh, clearly COVID was an example of what the health industry was looking at doing if you had a disability and then had COVID. I think what was very important was the fact that organizations like the protection advocacies at the state level, the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, um, and the policy work that's been done over the last 30, 40 years was such that we were able to prevent um, certain policies that would have been enacted from coming forward. I think when we look at the healthcare industry itself, um, we also have to look at in relationship to the society as a whole. And obviously, um, the Obama administration, the work that they did in the area with the ACA, very important. I think the disability community played a critical role in not allowing uh, the conservatives to roll back the ACA as much as they wanted to. I also found it very interesting to look at um, efforts that ADAPT, for example, were moving forward with when these various amendments were coming forward, you know, sitting in members' offices, having demonstrations, and how you now began to see people without disabilities or people maybe with disabilities that hadn't been identifying as people with disabilities coming forward and speaking up and speaking out in a way that I think people hadn't done before. So we may be at a place right now where there is more coalescing going on between people in the United States who have various healthcare needs that may be temporary or permanent, maybe a disability or not, in really looking at the value of healthcare. I mean, because healthcare is a complicated issue in the area of disability. I think, as we all know, most doctor's offices are not equipped to be able to have someone, for example, with a physical disability be able to come into their office and get appropriate services. And likewise, for people who have mental health disability, intellectual disabilities, other forms of disability, so many people, healthcare providers, have not been appropriately trained in even providing the most basic healthcare. And uh, so I would say the system itself, while 
moving forward, uh, in part because of laws that are being more enforced that are requiring things to happen. It, the healthcare, as, healthcare community as an industry has a lot further to go. I think there's value in the fact that 504, for example, is enabling, or the, one of the results is more disabled people being able to get into healthcare professions when they previously were denied the right to get into healthcare professions based on disability, not based on qualifications. But even there, that's going very slowly. Judy, from my perspective, perhaps the seminal Supreme Court ruling under the Americans with Disabilities Act was the 1999 Olmstead ruling that where basically the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote that people with disability have a constitutional right to live in the community rather than an institution if that's what they want to do. However, we know that providing the personal assistance services to allow people to live in the community is really, really hard. Um, this issue of health affairs talks about how hard it especially is in rural areas. I would like to hear your thoughts about 1999 Olmstead and whether you think that it is really true that people with disability get the supports that they need to live in their homes and communities. Well, obviously the Olmstead decision, by, uh, which was written by uh, Judge Ginsburg, was a pivotal piece of court rulings that really have resulted in reinforcing what people had been saying for decades. And you know what w I'm seeing as a user is a dwindling force of people who are a available and interested in doing this type of work. I think too frequently many legislators don't really understand the positive impact of having something like personal assistance can be not only on the individual to live outside of an institution, but also to be able to participate in the community, including in work. So we have a lot further to go in this regard. One, for me, I also think we need to be looking a lot more at the issue of immigration reform because we've got dreamers in the United States, 9, 10, 11 million dreamers who, some of whom would be interested in doing this type of work and other work, professional positions, um, but they can't get legal status to work. So I think that is a very critical issue that also has to be worked on. You mentioned uh, about 10 minutes ago in your wonderful colloquy about healthcare um, that there are are very few people with disabilities being educated to become healthcare professionals, especially doctors. And I just wondered if you could expand on that a little bit and talk a little bit about what you perceive as the barriers um, that are currently preventing people with disabilities from entering healthcare professions. I, I don't have the answer, I have thoughts. Some of my thoughts are that you know, um, for a while, I think before COVID, there were a series of ads that were on television and many other places uh, reaching out to uh, young girls, teenagers, in, regarding STEM. And they had uh, young women who came from every background. I never saw a single visibly disabled young woman in any of those um, ads. The absence of highlighting disabled people with visible disabilities and people with invisible disabilities by being able to interview people who have whatever their invisible disability may be means that we still are living in the legacy of um, not seeing ourselves. Judy, one of the things that we have seen in the last few years, of course, which has affected pretty much every person in the U.S. and in the world is the COVID-19 pandemic. And in some instances, it has affected um, individuals with disabilities um, a lot more in a more drastic way, as, as, as you've seen. And it's also shown that society, to some extent, was not prepared um, for this pandemic. Um, I know people with disabilities were not prepared for this pandemic, but we have had to deal with it. 
um, how do you think that this pandemic is going to affect um, disability rights from here on in after so many people that were not disabled initially got to some, to some extent experienced disability? It goes without saying that the United States and most other countries were not prepared for this pandemic, nor do I believe that we've necessarily learned what we need to learn skipping disability about what to do when future situations like this happen. What does it mean to be prepared and what are we being prepared for? You know, things that we're seeing as a result of COVID are vaccination rates in other areas for children going down. And what is that going to mean in the future if children are not appropriately vaccinated for um, illnesses that previously had been almost wiped out? I also think, though, that the disability community in some very real way is, has learned about um, the direction that the healthcare community would go in if left to its own and why it's been very important to have organizations like the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, the American Association of People with Disabilities, the National Disability Rights Network, which represents protection and advocacy agencies around the country, and how the bringing together of legal rights and human rights and a stronger disability community and getting the media more involved really, I think, help, I think, I think help prevent uh, further catastrophes. But when we look at the numbers of people who died with disabilities, I think one of the other issues is that people who died as a result of having uh, COVID plus diabetes plus hypertension, as an example, people weren't discussing uh, diabetes or hypertension as a disability. They were just words that were being put out there. In the disability community, and we were able to come in and look and say, these are disabled individuals who were being underserved before and um, as a result came in with more healthcare disparities and were at greater risk of um, dying from COVID because they also were not getting appropriate services in the community, obviously. And really, I think the public health system needs to be speaking up much more loudly about what is happening in trying to make people in our country feel that government does not represent them and not holding government responsible. But what else can we do in the healthcare system to make sure that they get the assistance they need so you know, God forbid we have another pandemic, we're not experiencing the same things in these communities. I mean, I don't think these are quick fixes. First of all, we need more disabled individuals, disabled individuals of color from the LGBT community, and also that healthcare providers who come from different racial backgrounds, sexual orientations, they need to also be understanding disability. They understand the link between poverty and disability in many cases, but we need to make sure that people are getting the appropriate preventative health care that they need. It's also people from the Latino community and the black community, Asian community, on and on, understanding that there are high-risk people within their communities that they may or may not define as having a disability but do have these comorbidities that um, people need to understand and really need to be paying much more attention to. It's looking at the public health care system in a community, the local public health hospitals, and talking to disabled people and health care providers in the local communities to understand what the gaps are and what needs to be done. I think these are the areas that we need to be focusing on and disability across the board is still not being looked at in a way that it needs to. And I think that's partly driven by our not having enough power within these different professions. 
Thank you to Judy Human for sharing with us her lived experience and amazing life, as well as to our themed advisors, Lisa Izoni and Javier Robles. It is our hope that you will read our October 22 issue, which covers research, commentary, and analysis on the topic of disability and health. For Health Affairs, I'm Vabrin Watts. Thanks for joining us. For more information on this topic, please visit us at healthaffairs.org. Thank you.